Welcome to Science Goes to the Movies. Up next is the second half of our two episode long conversation about math with comedian Lewis Black and physicist Brian Green. If you're just joining us now and you want to watch the first half first, you can catch up for free on YouTube or Vimeo or our podcasts or at cuny.tv. And now, Black and Green talk math and politics, ahead on Science Goes to the Movies. Welcome to Science Goes to the Movies, a look at the stories of science and how they change our culture. I'm Faith Saley, and this is a bit of a special episode. We recorded an interview with comedian Lewis Black and physicist Brian Greene that started out as a conversation about math jokes hidden in Futurama and The Simpsons, and it was good and you should watch that episode. But the episode ran over, way over, as Brian and Lewis and I talked about math and science and politics. And we've decided to share that conversation with you. And the only way we could do that and fit it into our TV time slot was by cutting the conversation into two episodes. So, last time on Science Goes to the Movies, Lewis Black wanted to know why a math sentence had to be absolutely correct to make any sense at all, and Brian Greene told us how and why mathematics made the universe seem so elegant. And now, the second half of the conversation. One of the best things about a correctly done calculation is that it's immutable, incontrovertible, and, and so you can build on it, or at least it used to be that way. Um, we seem to have lost faith in, in, in math. I mean, it applied from everything from the budget office, right, to, to climate change. And by that, I mean, you know, stuff don't add up and people don't care. Or it does add up and people don't care. I mean, I'm thinking about a recent tax bill, right? The, the, the numbers didn't add up the way some politicians say they do. So I guess the question is, where are we heading if math doesn't matter or isn't heeded, you know, let alone f science and facts. Yeah, well, I mean, I think it's, um, it's a situation that I never thought we would be in. I think many of us never thought we would be in, but I don't think I would describe it exactly as you do. I don't think people have looked at the math and said, oh, I'm no longer going to believe that mathematics. I think it's just there's been a release that's been allowed for by certain political developments where people are basically letting out things that were always there, but now they've got permission to release them to the world. And it's a general sense of, if I don't like those facts, I can ignore them, as opposed to I don't trust them. It's not about trust. It's about uh -huh. it's convenient to ignore. And that's what people have been given permission to do. Yeah, they have. They, like it, those facts don't enter my reality. It doesn't right? matter. Oh, and also because you can go because of the nature of the, because we're living between two ages of time. We're living, I believe, but this is a very primitive way to look at it, but we're living between, uh, a, a, let's say, an industrial age and a technological age. And we're in the very beginning of a technological age that, you know, so that, that you know, so that you've got the, the, uh, the, the what this breakdown of the of finding you know so you've got a, 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 a people can go to a, a place you know like a cave and meet, you know, on online and meet together with like-minded people who want to be in that cave and create whatever reality they w wish and 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 that reality remains legitimate to them and it's a reality that you know has been in that cave for you know we thought yeah. we had all the rocks up we get you know we've got now the, they have a microphone now yeah, they, it's like yeah. luddites unite yeah, yeah. But, but one thing i would say is you know we had this wonderful eclipse on august 21st 2017 and i don't know about 100 million people looked up to see it were they not trusting the equations no, they trusted the equations when it came to the eclipse because it wasn't inconvenient and didn't in some way impact their lives that they didn't like. When any of these folks who distrust climate change, when they get sick, are they going to go to the doctor? Yes, they're going to the doctor. Yeah. They trust science when it matters in that kind of way. So, and, and some of those schmucks, though, did, did when, it, when it came to the, the eclipse, actually look up without the glasses, <laughs> you know, they did, they went okay. That's true, <laughs> you know? I take back everything I said. <laughs> you know, the other thing I think, you know, and this is also taking, you know, going another way out on this is, is that 
What I f also feel we're occurring uh, is occurring right now is, is that we've tried for years to work from, you know, where intelligence was venerated and it hasn't worked out the way we all thought. So what we're trying now as an experiment is just complete ignorance of anything that but matters. But a celebration of ignorance. Huh? Yeah. A celebration of Oh, exactly. Of ignorance. But we've celebrated intelligence and, you know, did things Give it really, a chance. You know, now if, if we just see if how well ignorance goes, it might be the way it's going to work out. It's, it's always, I mean, it's just stunning to watch. Because well, it's, not, it's not anything any of us expected. Right. No, but, I mean, you know, Anyone who's got any kind of clarity would expect that you'd go, oh, okay, I'm gonna, in light of the facts, I'm not going to pay attention to them. I mean, that, that sentence is in, in, it's difficult even to say without it bringing a stroke on. You know, we talk a lot about literacy in terms of reading. Um, and I'm not a scientist. You are not a mathematician. But we use math in our lives. So how important is it that, that we as a population can add and subtract and divide. And I don't just mean we all agree two plus two equals four, but we're all good on slightly more complex things, like two to the power of three is eight. How, how important is some, something more than a basic math literacy? Uh, that's a tough question. I'm not a great fan of universal curricula that we apply to all kids. I think there are some kids for whom having that slightly deeper math understanding will be vital. I think there are other kids for whom it's not really going to matter in their lives in a deep way. And to drag and that's them all okay? through, I think that's okay. To drag kids through, I mean, I don't know what the, the base should be, which is part of what your question is. What's the minimum amount? The base is amount? 10. We're a 10, no, no. 10 base. <laughs> <laughs> all, right. Sorry. all right, I'll agree with okay. base 10. But, but, you know, what is the minimum I amount can, of I, knowledge? I, I, I think I can. I don't know. I think I can tell you. Uh, my mother used to teach math in, uh, in Washington, D.C., in the inner city, and the way she approached math was to make it practical. So mm -hmm. what she did was just walk into a store with the kids and go, you have uh, $5, and what do you buy with the $5? And it all has to add up to $5. That, I yeah. think, is the minimal the people, and that's, and I really think that has to be the approach. How, how, like with taxes, how does, how does math apply to your daily life so that you use that, so you have that tool? Right, almost starters. on an as-needed basis. Yeah, exactly. But to but drag talking, kids through calculus, yeah. just give you one example. Oh, I don't think I'm always told, well, this will sharpen the analytical mind, right? So doctors have to go through a course in calculus, and I know some really smart people who did not go to med school because they couldn't get through calculus or physics one, and I think, what? That's crazy. Crazy because they would not in their medical career use calculus or use physics. It would not be necessary. And I'm pretty certain they'd be great doctors based on what I know of them. And that's sad. H how important, it, we live in a democracy. H how important is math in a democracy? And I don't just mean the, co the confusing math that goes into the yeah. electoral college. I would say rationality is really what we should be focusing upon. We need to have rational, logical, coherent thinking where you go from A to B by a chain of reasoning that makes sense. And that's what's vital. And whether math is a language that you use to do that, mm, I don't know that it's all that critical. By the way, uh, I'm very conscious. As a professor of math, I'm saying yeah, that. So. But, but I, I'm very conscious now since, since you... Uh, sort of clarified, at least for you, the difference between math and arithmetic. When we're throwing around the word math here, we basically mean arithmetic, right? We're talking about... A de There's whoa, math. That right is there. math. Wait, when you look at that, does everything on that image say something to you? It does, yes. So whoever produced that did a nice job. I'm not checking everything, but it all looks pretty good. There's no nonsense. How long it makes, would it... makes me dizzy. It, it, it's, it's, I'm in awe of that like I would be if you sat down at a piano and just started playing. Or you guys just started speaking yeah, another really, language. If it was up there in Sanskrit, right, and you knew Sanskrit and I didn't, we'd be in a similar but reverse situation. It's really just a specific language articulated by a collection of symbols and a grammar that we as mathematicians understand. Can I, I'm going to question I've been interested in asking uh, since I knew we were going to be talking, which is how does, you know, in terms of practicality, how, how does, how, what is math's place in economics, which apparently is just a guesswork kind of a, of a thing, of a drug, you know, of a, of, sure. a, of a science or whatever one would call it? Well, they call it the dismal science, yeah, right? Yeah. Well, well, math plays a vital role, but the, the 
complexity of economic systems is what makes them difficult to analyze with certainty. Because so economics involves human behavior. It, there's right? human behavior and there's so many variables. There's so many things can shift and change that can affect the outcome. So what we do, the reason I do physics is because it is so damn simple. We talk about the motion of a single electron. There's no assumptions I really need to make. It's the electron. I use the equations and I can work out how it's going to move. Or when I talk about the entire universe, I model the universe as a big collection of matter described by one parameter, how dense the matter is. I don't worry about tables and chairs and all the details. So the art of mathematics as applied to the world is being able to slice out the details and be left with something that's simple enough that you can calculate but still relevant enough that the answers will have meaning to the world. And Economists have the challenge that they don't know exactly what to slice out, what is important, what's not important, and that's why different economists will come up with different answers. Thank you very much. <laughs> that was very good. Doesn't, no, that was. That doesn't was, no, that was, it? I've been looking for that. To, you know. Do you remember when I, it was George Bush, right? George W. Bush who said fuzzy math, right? Yeah. Doesn't that seem innocuous now? Fuzzy yeah. math was the least of our problems. When we're in a world where there's like a clear, definable attack on facts. And there's, there's this campaign of screw the facts and math is for nerds and, and things are what I believe they are because I believe they are. And we've lost our appreciation for the quantitative. So look, do, do look, you think we can get it back? How? I, I, well, you know, um, here's, here's how I look at things. Um, it's been 13.8 billion years since the Big Bang. And it's only like three years until 2020. So I think we're going to be OK. But when you, have a, when, you, when, you have, when you have a leader who I saw in a video clip tries on a hat at a rally and it messes up his hair and speaks about wanting to get the hairspray that he likes, but he can't get any longer because the scientists tell him that the molecules that he sprayed out, even when his windows are closed, can somehow get out and affect the atmosphere. What kind of nonsense is that? Well, that particular individual just needs a, a, a momentary uh, summary of how the world works. And, but, uh, to be but, fair, there are neutrinos in that hairspray that are all over the place. There are neutrinos and there's all sorts of other garbage. And what's not understood is the way that matter works and the way that matter behaves. And a basic understanding of that shows the fallacy in that kind of reasoning. And it's a, it's a sad state of affairs when someone like that is, in some sense, the leader of the world. Especially since uh, it was just announced this week that... <laughs> That because they are, we are not using that hairspray and things that have that, those chemicals, that the ozone layer is starting to close. That's right. That that hole that was there is beginning to close, which is extraordinary. I mean, yes. just in the midst of it all, extraordinary. You know what um, strikes me, Brian, is that uh, part of your love of math is, is that precision, is, is the clarification of it, right? There's not a lot to be argued with with a, with a math equation. Um, and that obviously fulfills you. On the other hand, you're a physicist who, who lives in great questions that many of which will probably not be answered in your lifetime. And it's, I admire the fact that you can live in both places, that, that you love clear cut thinking that is incontrovertible, and you also revel in questions that can never be answered, perhaps. Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. To, to be a, a physicist doing these kind of theoretical pursuits, you have to be comfortable with a great deal of uncertainty at the level of trying to answer the big questions like the origin of the universe and the nature of time. But as you make progress, you're making progress in a manner that's unassailable, mm -hmm. that will stand in some sense for eternity. Whether it's relevant or not, that can change. But the correctness of the mathematical sentences will stand forever. And I think maybe that's what gives you the security to think about the things that are so uncertain. Do, do you think that applies to you at all, trying to make a, a change in the world with your comedy, trying to ask big questions? Do you feel like every show, maybe every joke, every question you raise, either rhetorically or in a funny way, is, is a step towards something? No. Sadly. <laughs> <laughs> no, what I do think, yeah, I do, what I really do think is it's, it's always been kind of what I've felt for the longest time, when, since I've kind of been doing this professionally, is, is that, that if I can get someone to laugh, then what I've done is uh, get them to step back from their lives for an instant. That's, my, that's what I do. 
that's my help. And then, however, once they finish laughing, once again, they're screwed. But for that <laughs> brief moment, that's what I do. I don't see it in terms of like an arc. I see it in terms of creating a, that uh, what we provide, what comedians provide is insulation from madness. Huh. You know, I've never thought of this before, but you know how they always say if you're, if you're, if you're stressed or need to have clear thinking, breathe. And, yeah. and encouraging someone or forcing them to laugh is like a, it's making them breathe for a second. Yeah, it's supposedly like allowing... it, adds, and it adds time to your life. That, that, that I think is bull. <laughs> but, <Sounds good>. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, maybe maybe the laughter allows for something to get something to get in there, something to be absorbed, some slight new thought, right? Yeah. Um, on the last show, Brian and I talked about the butterfly effect or, or small discrepancies that grow huge over time. And on this show, Lewis, you asked about small errors in the equation sentence. Mm -hmm. Is our Continued disregard for facts and, and our failure to understand math, you, might it blow up our great American democracy experiment? No. No, because for uh, one of the things that, uh, one of the things I truly believe in is that, uh, is uh, for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. And that is the way in which our politics works. So what I believe you're seeing now is, is that this, you're seeing in the 60s, there was a group of people my age who were given, an, for, their, for the size of the numbers of kids that were out there, an inordinate amount of power by the powers that be. And what has occurred now is the same thing in the mirror in a sense of now that the other side the, the folks who had kind of, you know, like the, the same people who grew up with me and thought that this was what was going on at that point, look, you know, who wanted to maintain the status quo, who are now the status quo, there you get that response is this, it, it's the same. You've got, in, 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 the, the majority is giving this minority uh, an inordinate amount of power for, for what they, uh, for their size. And so for every time, so what, and what we see happening is, is okay, so you, uh, you elect George Bush, and then our response after eight years of that is, okay, we're going to elect, uh, we're for the first time ever going to elect a black man president of the United States, and boy, oh boy, look at well, how good are we? And then you go, boom, now we're going to elect the dumbest man you could possibly <laughs> find on the planet to be the president. And what happens after that? I don't know. But I know there's a reaction coming. I think it was what you said it better earlier on. Uh, so you could keep that part and get rid of this piece. Of but I think that that's really what you said. Is there you, some you math to describe this? This, this, this uh, what, that's H Hegel, right? Hegel, thesis, antithesis, right? That's, is there any... regression to the mean. You know, there is a kind of swinging of the pendulum that goes back and forth. Uh, but yes, I think that we will survive, but there are dire things that need to be addressed now, and if we don't address them, like climate change, then we may survive in a different world. I mean, talk about butterfly yeah. effect. It's, it's the dripping that, of the glaciers, right? more than a butterfly, right? yeah. yeah. Or, read, you know, or read The Skin of Our Teeth. By whom? By Thornton Wilder. Okay. Which really puts it, you know, that it, it really puts it well in terms of simple kind of Yes, there are catastrophes. Yes, we deal with catastrophes. Yes, we move on from yep. catastrophes. These are horrible times, but I've also lived through some horrible times, and I know people who've lived through worse mm -hmm. times. You know, uh, you know, World War II is much worse than just the schmuck bellowing and wandering around. You know, I, I, I saw something on Twitter that apparently resonated with lots and lots of people where someone reference the butterfly effect, which is we generally think things that happened in the past are having tiny things, uh, seemingly imperceptible, are having huge effects now. But the message of the butterfly effect is also something you, you do, you do maybe, politically today, politically, mathematically, some, something good that you, some truth you discover today can change the future in ways, I mean, I know it sounds like Mother Teresa, there are no, what is it, there are no great deeds or only small deeds that lead to great things, but you can sort of poetically apply the butterfly effect to a hopeful future, can you not? Why not? I agree with you. Yeah. Yeah, but you know, the, the, the uh, in, in a sense, 
something that we we forget within our e equation, which uh, which is interesting, I think, is is that those that a lot of the people who deny that you know you go it, it was struck me when you said that how old the, the since the Big Bang it's a g gazillion years. Yeah. Well, you've got a group of people who believe that the Earth is. Uh, is is much less than that. We'll only go to ten thousand years, and that that's the end of it. And so, and they have a tremendous amount of faith, and they truly believe that this is the that the words in that uh, the the Bible are are the are the words of God Himself, and that is their reality. And that we, in a sense, can kind of deny that and say, well, you you know, you're a little, you know, we've got these you know fossils. Hello, take a look. But but you can't deny their sense of faith and 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 how that kind of plays into the equation of a democracy, um, and so that the the big stunner to me was as I was at the Weather Channel of all places because I wander from channel to channel, and they, they, they there was someone who was wa going around the country talking to farmers about uh, climate change, and about how to deal with these problems and and how to deal with their crop rotation. And all of this, which is, you know, the basis of science and weather and all of this stuff that we've come to know. And, they, and you know, I don't know how many of the farmers, she said, would just go, you know, it doesn't matter because we're not going to, we're done. This is, fi we're finished up. Oh, their so lifetime that's why, was soon to be over. So well, that's why we don't have to pay attention to this. Huh. And you can't, I mean, we can have all the arguments we want about it, but that's, it's difficult, you know. You know, we have our faith, in a sense, in, uh, in, in, in what we have our faith in, and they have their faith in, in that, and what are you going to do? But can you imagine if you left that farm and got an aerial view and they somehow had math puns written in crop circles? Wouldn't you feel so relieved? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I ate some corn, and it was delicious. <laughs> um, before we go, Brian Green, are there any math jokes that you math professors are there any old chestnuts that we haven't oh covered God. on this show uh, are you people uh, funny when you get together uh, well whenever we get together which isn't often and the math jokes start to fly my, <laughs> wife, my wife who you know she quietly slips away and goes to the bar and starts to drink heavily give uh, me just give me one good oh old god what's joke. uh what's uh what's yellow and imaginary square root of a negative banana what's gray and undefined an elephant divided by zero why did the <laughs> chicken cross the mobius strip to get to the same Side. Uh, <laughs> there are three kinds of mathematicians: those who can count and those who can't. And I'll leave you with that. Lewis Black, you have an opener. Yeah, really? <laughs> you're good for you're good for a minute and a half. <laughs> and then I'm gonna have to. And then I'm gonna need you to sell you're merch. Good for a minute. You're, gonna... <laughs> you're good for a minute and a half, is what your wife says, right? Uh, yeah. um, bum. Oh, okay. Um, Brian Green, you've given me hope. And you've made me laugh, Lewis Black. So thank you, thank you both very much for being here. Thank you. Thank Unfortunately, you. that's all we have time for. Thank you for joining us today. For all of you watching, be sure to check out our Science Goes to the Movies Facebook page for web-only clips and keep up with everything related to Science Goes to the Movies all in one place. And if you want to watch past episodes or watch this one over and over and over again, uh, check us out at www.cuny.tv under the Science tab or try out our new YouTube channel where you'll find lots of science and movies. Thank you both. That was fantastic. Wow, I didn't realize that you would have so many at the ready. I did. I didn't there. know you were going to ask me that. That was there great. There are a lot of them. <laughs> wow. Wait, what was the I'm banana? I'm sure there are many others. The banana, it was, it was a negative What's yellow banana? and we, yellow and imaginary? Square root. Of, so it was your line. Imaginary <laughs> numbers, square root of a negative. So good. <laughs> that was great. That was a lot of fun. <laughs>